Welcome to the panel titled Superstar Firms and Innovation. This panel is hosted jointly by LMU's Institute for Strategy, Technology and Organization and NYU's Center for the Future of Management. So these joint panels are held semi-regularly and we'll mention about our next panel at the end of today's panel. So today we have two of the most well-known experts on this topic. Uh, we have Tommaso Valetti from Imperial College London and we have John Van Rienen from the London School of Economics. So just briefly on the format, we will start with some brief introductions of each of the panelists. Then we will jump into a moderated discussion. And after that, we'll take audience questions. One programming note, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to enter your questions, and we will get to as many of these as we can. And I'll hand over to my co-organizer, Rob Siemens. Thank you, Toby. Um, and, and thank you to all of you who are joining us. Uh, we've got two excellent speakers today, John Van Rienen and Tommaso Valetti. Uh, let me start with some brief introductions. Tommaso Valetti is professor of economics and head of the Department of Economics and Public Policy at the Imperial College London. He is a non-executive director uh, to the board of the Financial Conduct Authority. He is the director of the CEPR, Research and Policy Network on Competition Policy. He was the chief competition economist of the European Commission between 2016 and 2019. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about some of what he did during that time period as we dive into the topic for today. Uh, we're also joined by John Van Rienen. He's the Ronald Coase School Professor at the London School of Economics and Digital Fellow at the Initiative for Digital Economy at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology, MIT. He was the 2019 winner of the Euro Janssen Award which is the European equivalent of the Clark Medal, the Arrow Prize in 2011, the European Investment Bank Prize in 2014, and the HBR McKinsey Award in 2018. He's a fellow of the British Academy, the Econometric Society, the NBER, CEPR, and the London, uh, sorry, and the Society of Labor Economists. In 2017, he was awarded an OBE for Services to Public Policy and Economics by the Queen. So again, welcome, John and Tomasa. We're really excited to have you. And let, let's just jump right in. We're going to start with um, initially just a short question, a brief question to sort of set the table, so to speak. Um, what I want us to do is to start by hearing your definitions of superstar firms. So, so how do you define a super superstar uh, firm? Can you give us a sense of which firms we're talking about, you know, with, with some specific examples in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere? Um, John, why, why don't you start? Sure, you took me by surprise, Rob, because I, uh, I thought uh, I thought uh, Tomasa was starting, but I will I will start. So I think you know there isn't a hard and fast definition of what a superstar firm is, and I think often the definition is going to depend on what is the question that you're you know you're trying to answer. But I think often when we think of the superstars, we kind of think of uh, what sometimes we call the GAFAMs kind of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft group of firms. I like GAFAM because it's like, a, it's GAFA. So in, in English, you know, Cockney rhyming slang, GAFA means boss, is the boss firms, you know. And uh, Apple, for example, at the beginning of uh, this year, hit $3 trillion in market cap, which uh, is uh, bigger than the GDP of the UK economy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example. Of course, it's you know Microsoft's about two and a half trillion, and Google's Google Alphabet is about two trillion. So these are the kind of high tech digital giants. That's one way of doing it. But I think I, when I think about superstar firms, it kind of goes wider than that. So I like you know I like to think I like to look at various different measures. Employment is not a bad labor economics type of measure, for example. And, you know, if you look at, say, firms which have more than 5,000 employees in the U.S., it's about 2,500 firms, but they account, they're like, you know, 0.05% of all firms, but they account for something like 35% of all jobs. So that's a huge concentration of jobs in a, in a relatively small number of firms. And that actually underestimates the, the, their importance, because if you look at sales, that it's even more concentrated. So many of like the, like the GAFAM firms, the digital giants, they have what my former colleague at MIT called scale without mass. They have relatively few jobs. It goes to the Mountain View you know, headquarters of Google. There's not many people, but massive sales. 
And, you know, if you look at sales, the thing, you know, it's actually, we can talk about this, revenue is even more concentrated. So, you know, those are a few of the measures that, 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 uh, that you, can, you can use. Thanks, John. Tommaso? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Rob and uh, Toby, for organizing this. Uh, first, since we're going to talk about companies and uh, there is lots of money in this field, I should make disclosures. And um, I don't have anything to disclose, but I think it's important that people make disclosures upfront. And uh, so I'm also defining superstars in a specific context of what I've dealt with, which is competition economics, these are the GAFAM. Probably Microsoft is the odd one out, so even better for Cockney's uh, actually GAFA without the M. Um, I will add to what John said. These companies have, sure, different business models. Some is advertising based, some are selling stuff, some are inter intermediaries, but they have some common threads. Common thread is that there is very huge network effects one way or another. These network effects sooner or later turn into huge switching costs for consumers. So there is always a, a big trade off there, uh, which is a, a quite dramatic these days. Um, there is an intermediation function that these companies do in many instances. And uh, and there's lots of, lots of externalities, generally speaking, uh, can be positive, can be, ne can be negative. I will, uh, I will um, give some examples. Um, these companies also have been through different periods. I see two decades when it comes to this uh, big platform, big tech companies. Uh, from the early 90s till 2005, 2008 at most, it was really an exciting growing phase. And there is uh, 10, 15 years of consolidation and uh, persistent dominance, which is something that people don't. So there, there has been this competition in the market for a while, but then uh, that idea of dynamic competition is long gone. It's, uh, it's an hypothesis. Just to give you some numbers, Google since 2008, 2009 has held a market share in excess of 90% of searches through desktops in the European Union. The, 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 the market share on, uh, on cell devices, on, uh, on, uh, on um, uh, cell phones is even higher because not only Google is by default the search engine on Android, which is owned by Google, but also Google is paying billions of dollars every year to Apple to be pre-installed as search engine also on Apple phones. Facebook, uh, you have to read cases because very little academic research has been done on these companies, but Facebook, if you look at the German antitrust case, which is ongoing, has had for many years, for over a decade, 90% of daily active users in, the, in Germany, for instance. If you read through the internal documents that now the DOJ and the FTC are investigating in the US, they started saying since 2011, to their own uh, advertising clients that they'd ha they had already 95% of uh, all the advertising on social media in the US. You can find similar figures for Amazon in the ongoing cases in the in which are happening in Europe right now. So another common thread of these companies is that they've been exceptionally good, but they've been also on the radar of antitrust authorities for a while. Uh, the third common thing that I would say, uh, because um, I need to be, I, I don't want to be, provocative unnecessarily, but also I have to reflect on it. Um, we're talking about 25 years of uh, this platform existing in our world, and there has been very limited progress from the profession, from the economics side on the understanding of those platforms, in particular, this the super big one. So let me elaborate on this big statement. Why has it been a failure from our profession? Well, if you heard the debate 25 years ago, when the first generation of models were being written by economists on two-sided markets, multi-sided platforms, basically the argument would be, these are fantastic things because they create markets that wouldn't exist otherwise. There is a reduction in transaction cost, the demand can meet supply, but there are very strong network externalities and these network externalities may lead to monopolization and monopolization is not good for consumers. So there is a trade-off between market expansion and monopolization. If you hear the debate we're having now on how to regulate the Google, the Facebook, the Amazon of nowadays, but that's a quarter of a century later, you hear the same arguments again. So I cannot say that this has been a very successful period for economics to to improve our understanding over and above what we knew 25 years ago. On the empirical side, 
It's not the economist's fault, of course, but uh, academics never had access to any primary data from Google, Amazon, or Apple, or whatever, to do uh, research on these issues. There is tangential question that we could tackle. And so also our understanding from, and, and that was, of course, a, a, a choice by choice that, that they didn't want to engage with, with academics. So. On the policy side and on the academic side, we haven't made many progress. And that's also another common thread which concerns these companies. Well, wait, just, I mean, just, it's, it's kind of useful to have this. We, we, we didn't, I, I, somebody out there, we didn't plan this in, in advance, advance at all. And you know, it, it's interesting because certainly a lot of the debate is exactly as Tom Asso says, we focus on the kind of digital monopolist. But you know, in my work, I, I kind of, I mean, I, I like to, I mean, I like this conversation as well. It's like a broad view because I think, you know, as Tom Asso said, one of the striking things about the gap out is that you see that, you know, there's amazing growth. You know, they've, they've gone from very small players to kind of huge, huge players. But you also see the same kind of growth of superstar firms in many of the other non-digital sectors too. So, for example, if you, you know, go, I, I, you know, I mentioned that if you took the, if you did a definition where you just took uh, US firms with more than 5,000 workers, they accounted for 35% of all jobs. If you went back to the mid 80s, they accounted for only 28% of all jobs. So there's been a, you know, so like a seven percentage point increase of the concentration of jobs in these largest firms. And, you know, that's a very, very large increase. And it's even bigger if you look at sales and even bigger if you look at sales relative to the industry. And that certainly has, you know, happened in some of the high tech sectors. But it's also happened in many of the non-high tech sectors. So if you look at retail, for example, it's become increasingly dominated by firms like Walmart and Costco. If you look at, um, um, you know, logistics, it's dominated by firms like FedEx. If you look at financial services, it's become dominated by the big banks, which, you know, is to do with, the, you know, when you think about the impact of the global financial crisis. So there does seem to be a, a more general phenomena that we see in the US and in, in Europe and other countries of the kind of movement to the dominance of very large firms, which I think is kind of interesting. It's different. You know, we'll get on to why that is, but I think it's a kind of broader phenomena than just what's happening in the kind of digital sectors. Follow on on that. The, there's a difference, though. Some of these companies, so there is a, a general you know, tendency of superstars. There's lots of originating markets and the work of John and others has been very enlightening. Uh, the difference of a Gatham, though, is that they manage to navigate outside any regulatory boxes because they are not supplying, I don't know, infrastructure. So they are not like telecom providers. They don't supply content. So they're not media providers either. So the Walmart, for instance, if you, there is a product which has a defect, which you buy from Walmart, uh, Walmart has a liability, for instance, to, to, to replace the product or give you the money back. But in principle, this doesn't exist on Amazon, say, unless Amazon is supplying directly their own products, of course, but they are just a pure intermediary between you and uh, Chinese suppliers. They don't have that liability. So, so and, and and apparently this was a very clear strategy of Jeff uh, a, of Amazon since the early days to, to, to navigate outside what was you know the labor laws, the antitrust laws, the privacy laws to make sure nobody would actually catch them. And this has been also the problem on the policy side, not being able to put them into any boxes and always arriving ten years too late when things are already accomplished in a sense. All right, excellent. Um, so thanks very much for the uh, for the definition. For the record, John, I completely agree. Gaffem sounds awesome. So I think Facebook has kind of blindsided us by renaming because Gamma doesn't sound half as cool as uh, as Gaffem. I think. Um, so it's like Gamma rays. It's got a Hulk Hulk type of. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you know, both both of you have uh, have made that point that it, there there seems to be a tendency to for the for the already large firms to become even even larger. And uh, Tomas has mentioned network effects. John, you said that this need not be you know just the digital uh, the the digital giants, but there's other superstar firms as well. So, what is it that helps these firms grow so fast? What is it that, that they do differently from, from non-superstar firms? And I guess as you know, Rob and I are professors of strategy and you two are economists, um, be interesting to see if, if, if you see a role for strategy um, or what, what just what is it? What's, what's special about them? So and maybe, uh, who um, do you want to start Tommaso, given no. John has had the first one? 
So what do they do differently? So obviously super successful and everybody would want to be one of those guys. Uh, so that's uh, good. So, but it's, it's also very difficult to compete against them. So lots of the growth that we've observed come from organic growth. But again, what's different is that some of this growth came through uh, a, a, an almost unlimited number of acquisitions. So, so people know more or less this figure, but in the past 20 years, GAFAM bought a thousand companies with none being ever blocked. Actually, the CMA, which is the UK regulator, blocked one last December acquisition um, by Facebook of uh, Giphy. So it's 1,001 to one now. So it's a, it's a, it's a small consolation. So, so there is a, a big uh, problem there. Um, no one is saying that all those acquisitions should have been blocked, by the way, but 1,000 to zero or 1,001 to one. Well, actually, some people are saying that, aren't they? Is, is, isn't that, isn't that uh, the... Isn't that in one of the uh, the Platform Competition Opportunities Act, which is uh, going through Congress, which is, is exactly proposing? No, no, anyway, no, no, that, that, we, got, we can get on to that. <laughs> reversing the, the 1001, maybe there's a few of those that should be reversed, but not 1000. But but, but but there's clearly an area of under-enforcement there. The other one is competition on the merit versus competition through abusing market power. With size, with dominance comes also the ability to abuse. and uh, And... And really, the academic crowd knows a bit less, but there is an, an, a very large number of ongoing cases in Europe, in, in member states in Europe, the European Commission, the UK, which is separate now from the EU, in Australia and South Korea, in the US, there are bills. So there is lots of cases on, on antitrust. But just to give you an example of how difficult it is to enter their own ecosystem or to compete with the ecosystem, um, the ecosystem is sometimes designed to keep people in, you know? not, 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 not allowing anybody to, to get out of it. And that's not very uh, pro content. There is even research now by um, Hunt Alcott and Matt Jenskow and uh, Lena Song, which I think is a student at NYU. Now she's just finishing, which is showing that uh, they, 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 they also have an incentive to create addiction. So a, a, addictive ecosystems. So, so they, they calculate that a third of the time that we spend on Facebook is time that exposed we regret about, but we cannot avoid doing it, which is the definition of addiction because of the viral content pro-Trump, against Trump, pro, pro wearing mask or against wearing mask because the algorithm does what it takes to keep you engaged as much as possible, which is getting your time and then extract a signal, which is useful to show you some ads at some point in time. But to show how difficult it is, I'll give you an example and then I'll, uh, I'll give it to John. And that's also how difficult, how different it is to other industries. Uh, take January 6th last year, the riots in, the, in the Capitol Hill. Coincidentally, on the same day, WhatsApp announced also a change in the terms of, of service, making it basically reducing the privacy levels to WhatsApp users in the US and in the rest of the world. And this didn't pass unnoticed and people started saying, well, we should do something. They even misinterpreted what actually that policy change was. They thought it was the end of encryption, which wasn't the case. But and then people say, let's do something. Let's uh, try to move, migrate to an alternative. And obviously Telegram and Signal were actually mentioned. And perhaps some of us did download Signal or Telegram and some of you did the same in the audience. But then that's not the right metric. You have to ask yourself how often since January 6th, 2021, have you actually used Signal and Telegram? Maybe you have a couple of friends, you have some odd conversation, but you were not able to move your chat groups. You were not able to convince your mom. You were not able to convince all your friends to do that. And uh, that may com competition. If you look at the actual usage, Signal, for instance, is not even in the, in the top 10 of the providers in the world. So it's very limited usage. So, so that's downloading and trying once it has nothing to do with the way this, this platform as, as used. And that's different instead in other, in other industries. So in the US, you don't have great competition among uh, uh, cellular companies, but there is some. And if you do change operator, you can still call another guy, whether they are on AT&T or T-Mobile or whatever, or whether they are on Verizon, you can still uh, be interconnected. You can port your number. In Europe, you can, I don't know exactly the regulation in the US, you can keep all your contacts. And that makes competition much more easy, which is where the debate is now, to allow other firms to have a chance, not to regulate for the sake of regulation, but to other, to, in a sense, for, as an economic, from an economics point of view, making sure that the good externalities are preserved, but they don't accrue to a single firm because that makes then competition impossible. Great. Um, 
So uh, yeah, at the risk of sounding like an old school economist, <laughs> so, so I, just, just for people in the audience who you know who may not be as immersed in all these debates, I just just step, stepping back a bit about what the debates the debates kind of are, and you know the way that the, the economy works, the market economy works, is this very you know it, it is incredibly unequal. It's always been very unequal. Some firms have a lot of activity. Some firms don't have much activity. Some firms are very productive, better managed. Some firms are really badly managed and, and you know unproductive. And you know what happens in a market economy is is a constant reallocation. A constant kind of creative destruction where the on average you see the, the more successful firms of other firms getting larger and the less successful ones shrinking. And that's kind of what we want. We want to have that dynamism which enables um, that reallocation to take place. The more innovative firms, the more successful firms to grow, the less ones to kind of kind of shrink it and gets get get smaller. So that's part of what happens and part of what, you know, why superstars are superstars is they're doing often something better than other firms or innovative, efficient, or whatever it is. But there's a special thing and a series of special things that Tom also you know, said this, the network effects are really important in, the, in these sectors, which means that, uh, you know, there's Google effects, for example, you know, if you build a better search engine, more people use that, you get more data on people, therefore the search engine goes even better. So you get a direct network effect, a platform like Facebook, the more people use it, the better, the more people want to stay on it. So that's a kind of network, a direct network effect, there's indirect network effects for a big platform, you have more developers on. So that gives a, an advantage. And even if you may only have a small you know, improvements over another firm, the whole market can tip to you and you become a, you know, a, a, dominant, a, a dominant firm. And then it becomes very often very hard for new players to en 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 enter, enter that market. So that kind of winner-take-all, winner-take-most type of phenomena is, you know, is an aspect of many markets, but it's particularly strong in the kind of markets that we're, we're speaking of. In addition to that um, is the importance of, a, you know, you might think of these broadly as fixed costs, so, you know, just to build the search engine or to build a platform just takes a lot of resources, um, you know, to build, you know, and, and to, to expend money on, say, even if you're, a, you know, an offline retailer like Walmart, you can spend huge amounts of money on software in order to manage your distribution system. A small player can't do that. So the rise of those type of fixed costs up and around intangible capital is a second reason why you get dominance of, 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 of very large of very large firms. So both of those things are going on and you know the, the two important facts in explaining why we've got this kind of uh, increase of dominance of firms. And then you know as Tom also says the, then the critical thing and this is critical from a policy point of view is how much of those things are just because of the nature of technology changing but how much of those things of, of the dominance of the large firms is due to them doing things which keeps potential competitors out or small rivals small. And, you know, John also mentioned a few, there's many, many things. I, I agree with him that the one of the key thing in this area is interoperability, the ability of other players to get access to the network. I mean, we know, we, we, we think about this very commonly when we think about telecommunications or even railways, but this is, you know, absolutely critical as well in these, dig in these digital spheres. And firms often reduce, deliberately limit that interoperability in order to maintain moats and protection for the, the, the power. And that's the thing we have to think very carefully about as related to data. We also have to think carefully about the way the uh, intellectual property system works. So patents, you know, are a reward for innovation, but they can also be used through patent thickets as a way of keeping out other potential innovators. And that, that can be used and abused. There's, you know, I think Tom uh, mentioned also this killer acquisitions phenomena. You know, you might get a lot of merging of firms and acquiring of the small firms. And some of that can be a good thing because it enables the you know, small firms to use their technology better. But some of that can be used to kill off a nascent competitor. Think about Facebook, WhatsApp, or Facebook, Instagram, um, and you know, e you know, even worse, you know, then we have evidence that some of these firms, um, say from pharmaceuticals, for example, buy up potential firms and actually stop their innovation completely because they're already selling a product like a, a branded, a branded drug for which this new product can compete with. So there's lots of things like that, and those are the really worrying things. So those are the things that we really worry about can actually mean why the kind of super, the large firms, superstar firms, if they start using their power in order to reduce competition, that will also tend to reduce welfare, productivity, and other, other good things that we want to get from the capital system. Sorry, that was a very long-winded 
explanation, but I, that's the that's how I kind of try to think about this. this. I'll, um, I'll complement that, John, with um, a couple of thoughts. One, which is probably less contentious, is that sure there is a some competitive advantage in a core product, say search or the size of the social network. But then there is lots of expansion into adjacent markets. And that's, and that's where com competition problems arise a lot. So the cases I dealt at, at the European Commission, for instance, Google is a great search engine, but then when they start putting in Google Shopping, only their products in the box, the nicely, highly graphical interface that we like that shows us the price of a pair of sneakers we're looking for and denies access to the box to any competitor, that's a problem. When Google uses a filter to demote the rivals irrespective of the quality of the search to page 10 that nobody actually ever lands on the, on the page 10 because there is lots of inertia and people look only at the first and second result, that is a problem as well, okay? And that's a different from us. So this expansion into adjacent, even the, the, the notion that sometimes we have as economists distinguishing between horizontal and vertical relations, which is fine in traditional markets, it's something you have to rethink because sometimes some, some acquisitions look vertical at first, but then all of a sudden they morph into a new system which is competing with the original one. I have in particular in mind the, the many dozens of acquisitions that Google did in the ad tech space starting with Google double click in 2007 and, and then going on. And we started from a place where there were alternatives for publisher to find uh, alter, alternative ways of actually landing their, their, their ads into a space which is monopolized everywhere in the value chain, despite the, the, they, they were in principle vertical mergers that as economists, we had even a presumption that they would have generated efficiencies. Instead, we have generated foreclosure into that market. So that's, that's, that's something to, which is, uh, complementing what you said. The other open thought, which is, I don't have a strong, we never thought explicitly, but if there is really a strong advantage into the size of a search engine, etc. So, so this is, this should be uh, a place for for regulation because uh, because an unregulated monopolist, which is uncontested for fifteen years, is 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 not a good space for society, I think. But there is nobody which is uh, suggest, suggesting that. But if indeed uh, economies of scale or network effects are so huge and no one can ever contest ever again, uh, then uh, the, the, you know, the, the end game should, should, should be direct regulation of that. So I, I don't think we're getting there. The regulation that perhaps we will speak about in a moment will be more geared towards trying to introduce some competition also in the core services in order to avoid getting there. But it's a question we should bear in mind. I mean, so, I mean there's a, so just, just to come back on two of those things, I don't know if you want to go into the regulation thing, but I mean, my, I mean, the way I think of the direction of travel is, is towards regulation, because if I mean, take the UK, for example, where we, we're both in London right now, ironically, uh, given that this is a, you know, an NYU thing. But, you know, the digital markets unit, which is being set up as part of the, you know, the new um, um, attempt to look at the um, plat, you know, big plat platforms, is you know explicitly there? I think to kind of think about ex ante ex ante regulation to think about trying to be proactive in thinking about what you could do um, to regulate these these. Now, maybe not enough, but it's certainly not the traditional you know things that you know you 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 I was involved with, you were involved with, which is a reaction to existing proposals of doing uh, mergers or of trying to you know sort things out ex post is actually more of an ex ante type of thing. So I think that is really where we're going. And I think it's you know, it's the right way to go because I think these are, um, I mean, we have to think of a different type of regulation because it's not the traditional type of regulation we have for utilities, but that type of having standing bodies, which are you know staffed with people who can actually get to know what's in these sectors and actually make proposals to, to do things, I think is, is the direction. I just want to say one quick thing though on, on I mean, I, I, you know, just going back to the first point you made on moving into, into adjacent markets, and I think that is a key thing about what the the the, the, the gap are. And you know, I think on the one hand, it's not always a bad thing because often, you know, the technologies that these companies have can be used in lots of different areas and new areas, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I, I totally agree. You know, if it becomes self-preferencing that you kind of preference things for your your own 
your own platforms and against others, that, that can be harmful. And additionally, the way that companies can do this can also be harmful. So, you know, I was, um, you know, this is a long time ago, but I was, you know, very much involved in the commission versus Microsoft case on, on the commission side. And there, that case was exactly about, you know, it's ironic given a lot of these coming back from the other companies that, but that was directly an example where Microsoft was trying to use its market power in that case on the desktop to extend this market power into other adjacent markets. And, you know, one of the mechanisms for doing that in this, for example, one of the commission's case was in from the kind of desktop PC into the server, the low end server market of the operating system of those. The way they were doing that was we're limiting interoperability. And it, at one hand, you might say, well, why would they want to do that? Because, you know, it reduces the profits they get from the desktop. Well, exactly what they were trying to do is to try and get into and monopolize an, an adjacent market. And, you know, if you couldn't get access to the desktop, that was a big problem. And that, that idea of limiting interoperability in order to um, control, control adjacent markets is the kind of antitrust thing that we kind of worry, worry about because it reduces, both privileges you and also reduces competition and reduces innovation. It's also, uh, Tommaso, sorry, I, I know you want to respond and, and I'll turn it to you in just one sec. I just want to remind the audience um, to please use the Zoom Q&A feature uh, to, to, to start asking some questions and, and very shortly we'll get to those. Uh, Tommaso, back over to you. I just want to say that obviously the Microsoft and this leveraging is something we are accustomed to, but there's also new ways of thinking and there's... Um, there are strategy scholars here, and it would be great if you guys could have a view on, on it. I'm going to give you an example because then you can generalize and see if there is anything. So a lot of discussion happened about a year ago when there was yet again another acquisition that has been approved of um, uh, Google buying Fitbit. You know, so Fitbit are these wearable watches that gather information about our health. And the analysis, so it was approved, and the analysis of the commission was, well, in Europe, there are very few Fitbit users. It's only, what, 5 million, 6 million, so whatever. We don't think well, there's going to be any impact. The European Union is, 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 is half a billion uh, citizens at the end of the day. And in, instead, there is something that I disagree with, because the way, that this, well, the way Google is going to use Fitbit is to train the algorithm on a pool of five, six, seven, I don't know how many million users they have in the, in the Europe, cross-link that information with whatever they know from your Gmail, your Chrome usage, your Android downloads, or YouTube videos, I mean, you name it. It's a, it's a, it's a very vast uh, ecosystem. And then the results of uh, that algorithm training that pool of data will, will be applied to everybody using Chrome, everybody using uh, the search engine, everybody downloaded stuff on Android. So the impact is is, uh, is on, uh, on half a billion users if it is in the, in, the, in the Europe. So that's novel. What's also novel and something that would be great to try to, to put, I don't know, in formal terms or have a theory, many of the concerns that people have now of, say, Google or Facebook entering new markets is in particular in the market for health and in the market for financial services. So these are markets that, as economists, we say there are these asymmetric information uh, you, as an entrepreneur asking for a loan, know better about uh, the risk profile of your investment. The bank doesn't know. You, as a driver, know much better if you are a great driver or a crazy one when you go to the insurance company. And there is limits to competition in those markets, which are driven by moral hazard, by adverse selection, and the like. Now, the change, but at least those banks or insurers or, or, or health providers are all on, a, on, a, on an equal position. Now enter Google, okay? This hypothetical firm that is gonna collect all the information about you, they will have perfect information about your health, you know, because they see exactly, they will have perfect information about your risk attitude. They see if you're going on, uh, on a gambling website or whatever, they know whether you're having an affair and this is, you are at risk of breaking your marriage, which is one of the biggest pre predictor of, of, of people being in a financial distress. Now, you are gonna, you may, you may of course, end up in a situation where we have one player with perfect information about everybody and the rest not having that information. This is gonna tip the market very soon in one di di direction only, and you end up in a market which is perhaps efficient, but it gets as close as it, it could be to the textbook first 
degree price discrimination monopolist, okay? This is the guy that extracts all consumer surplus, and that's not a good place for society. So this is new. This is new. It, it is, this, this is not the Microsoft. This is not the operating system back then. This is something new. It may be novel, but this is why I, mean, I wanted to mention it to a crowd of academics as long as you're interested in this stuff, because it's something you can elaborate on, because this is interesting in my opinion. Okay, um, <clears throat> we've started to get some audience questions in, so we're, we're going to start turning to those. Again, if the audience has questions, please you know, start sending them in via the, the Zoom Q&A. We'll get to as many of these as we, as we can. So we've talked so far in the conversation a little bit about firms competing against each other. We've talked about you know, consumers and the extent to which they benefit or, or not. Um, let, let's switch it a little bit. Now, now let's think about inputs to the firm, in particular thinking about labor. So Danny Kim has a question. I'll read it out loud to you. How do you think the rise of superstar firms will affect the allocation of talent? Sure, they'll generally capture more, but should we expect differential trends between our best and brightest talent versus the average talent base? Uh, John, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. That's a great, that's a, that's a really great, and it's a really fascinating question. It's really, it's at, the, at the research frontier, where a lot of people are, are thinking about this. So how does this, these trends we've seen in the product market, affect what's happening in the labor market. So there's lots of different things happening. So one mechanism is the one that I think um, that, that Kim was describing that, you know, these, the very best firms, the superstar firms got to hoover up talent. So a lot of the very top human capital is going into these very successful firms. And in fact, if you look at the labor market as a whole in the US and in many other countries, you see this increased inequality that you see between firms in terms of the kind of size and the productivity mirrored in the increasing dispersion of wages. You have a kind of a McKinsey, McDonald's type of economy where the, you know, the kind of very high rent firms and the very high skilled workers kind of work together like McKinsey and at the other end of the labor market, the kind of the kind of low low skill people work, you know, in in, in smaller and smaller firms. So this, sorry, in, in less productive firms and, and less productive workers. So this is going on, and it's a kind of worry because you know if those top, you know, imagine you have a, a Google hoovers up all the best AI people in the world. There's not that many people, <laughs> so that actually gives another form of competitive advantage to the superstars if they can kind of lock in a lot of a lot of the talent. So that's one aspect of of what's, what's kind of going on. The other aspect, of course, is it's a force for increased inequality. So in fact, one of the stunning things in the US economy is if you look over the last 40 years at inequality with wages between individuals, there's relatively small amounts of increase of inequality within, within firms. It's all dominated by this between firm inequality, this kind of McKinsey McDonald's effect. So it's a force for increasing general inequality across different different wages across workers. And a third phenomenon, this is the kind of thing that David Alter, Larry Katz, and David Dorn, Christina Passan, and I focused on our kind of, you know, our QJA paper a couple of years ago, is that it also, um, one of the other features of these kind of superstar firms is that, you know, they although they pay high wages, the share of revenues or value added going to workers is pretty small in these firms, which is the flip side of saying they have pretty high markups. You know, high markups, high profits, so the share of labor is lower. So as the weight of the economy shifts towards the superstars, the overall share of labor in the economy tends to fall. And that's kind of what we showed has been happening in the US, that as the you see this growth of these superstar firms, you see a fall of the share of overall GDP of national income going to workers. And, you know, is that a problem? Well, it, you know, it, pu it pushes, is another force for inequality because most of the income that we get is our labor income, not our capital income much more unequally distributed capital incomes. This is another force for inequality. I think all those phenomena, I haven't even got onto the monopsony side of things yet, are, are, are kind of things where it, it actually is a concern of what's happening in the labor market, these product market changes. Okay, can I just ask a quick follow-up question to that though, uh, Tomasa, before turning to you. Uh, so, so John, so, uh, so, so you, you kept using the term, you know, Google hoovering up the, uh, the, the, the high-end talent. Uh, how is it that they're able to do that? Can't can't a competitor firm hire that talent as well? They, they can certainly they, offer, they can certainly try, they, they can certainly try to, and they do, and people do do work for the firms. But of course, it, they're earning very high rents, they're earning very high profits, so they can afford to pay those um, workers much higher wages, and they have an incentive to do so if it's a way of locking in locking in their market power. So there is a there is a no, there is a kind of competition angle in, 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 in this as well. Of course, it doesn't always work. 
So I was talking to, I won't name it, one of the GAFAMs, one of the people in the GAFAMs in Silicon Valley one time, I was over there from MIT, and uh, he said that one of his biggest problems is, you know, one of these thousand acquisitions, which Tomasa was talking about, he just, they just kind of bought up this AI firm and uh, he asked his deputy, well, I haven't seen the CEO of the startup that I bought, you know, what, what's happened? And his deputy said, oh, I'm sorry, but the guy's kind of called in rich. <laughs> so it is an example of that you might buy these people out, it's hard to motivate them because they're now part of, you know, a bigger bureaucracy and they're not so incentivized to work, which is another reason, of course, why. This may not be the optimal allocation of resources because you're not really getting enough productivity out of these workers. Thanks. Uh, Tomaso, did you want to weigh in on this question as well? Very, very quickly. It's a, it's, it's a great question. I will just add that there is evidence uh, in the past 30, 40 years of what John was uh, describing as a polarization in the, in, the, in, the, in the labor market. And this comes along with investment in automation and uh, the work of Asimo, Blue Restrepo, and others. Um, and so, so basically where investment in automation can be complementary for a few people at the very top, so that increases your productivity and your salary, but it's actually a substitute for like repetitive task, a blue collar type of things. And so you have clearly in the data starting in the 80s with this, uh, this, uh, this uh, huge uh, increase in the, in the wage differentials at the top, which have followed more or less productivity and at the bottom instead that they remain flat. And the, the other comment I have is uh, just because you mentioned a little bit uh, acquiring talent um, is a, a little bit of, of a mythical going back. That's where I come from, which is a competition angle. All these thousands of, of uh, mergers, um, the, the, the GAFAM reacted by saying, no, 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 but we are just buying talent. Even Halvarian, who is um, uh, chief economist of Google for the past 20 years, called them acqui-hires, so acquisition for hiring people. And actually, these are buzzwords. If you look at the data, there is nothing of that sort in the data. If you, there, are, there are people in organizational science that actually try to do some work, and they look at exactly what happens at the people acquired. Incidentally, many of these companies acquired they have already millions of users. They have already lots of stuff, etc. But they see that it is more likely once you are bought, being bought by Google and Facebook that you leave. Not only if you are the, the CEO because you're super rich, but you, they don't want you. They, they actually want your subscriber base. So this mythical thing of acquire hires is one of those theoretical possibilities that we actually don't see in the data. There's also this thing about. Um... You know, you often hear the view that, you know, that you you want, you know, you want the gap, you know, the, 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 the sort of superstars say, you, know, you want to allow lots of takeovers by the, the gap owners of startups because this is their incentive. You know, the venture, you get money from the venture capitalists and they have an exit strategy and the exit strategy is to be bought by Google or Facebook or Apple. And they say it's a good thing because it gives you an incentive to innovate because you want to be bought up. And, you know, clearly that is part of the incentive. But if, you know, it's, they're, they're not the only game in town, you know, maybe if, if one of these firms was not bought up, they would have formed their own, they'd have done an IPO like, like we used to in the old days and formed a new firm, which actually could have become a viable competitor to some of the platforms. Or they may have been bought up by a different type of firm rather than necessarily the kind of platform firm. So I think, the, you know, the, often the, 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 the pushback that you get from some of the superstars that, oh, don't make life too difficult for us to acquire some of these startups because you'll kill off the incentive to be a startup is, is really misplaced because there will still be incentives to be successful even if you can't necessarily be bought up by one of these, uh, these very large firms. Yeah. yeah, so the debate here is not prohibiting any acquisition by any firm of startups, but it's just uh, having a restraint on, uh, on firms at the very top. On, uh, on VC, as an, on, on the exit, you know, in, in, innovating for exit, sure, there is, that's, a, that's a big story, but also it's, it's a partial story. There's limited evidence. Once again, data are imperfect by definition, but so the work by Luigi Zingales and Kamepali and Ryan, it's called the kill zone. They're, they are looking at actually VC investment uh, into industries 
No, there is a certain rate of this investment, but as an industry becomes dominated either by Facebook or by Google, these are the two firms they concentrate on, the rate of VC investment goes down. And the idea is, but why? Because you need to negotiate the price. And if the only guy in town can only be Google, you can be sure that you're not going to be very successful in, a, in, a, in, a, in extracting a good price. So maybe it's better to move into another industry, which is not so, 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 so dominated. So there is evidence that in the past 10 years, again, this is not a general proposition, but with dominant, they, they, it comes all these side effects, which are actually not very good. Uh, I'll, and just also, say, I'll, I'll just say one more thing on this, because we were so excited. About this. It's a really interesting research area. There is also a worry, not just the monopoly power, which I guess we focused on, but of monopsony power. So, um, you know, with a big merger, the traditional thing as we look at whether consumers become worse off because prices are high, which is fine. That's what you know. So, also was doing when he's when he was, uh, you know, chief economist. But it's also the question of, you know, often when firms merge, they might get power in the labour market um, to keep wages wages down. And, you know, there's an argument over how big or how small that effect is, but certainly in some local labor markets where they become very concentrated or when there's a very small group of skilled workers, then, you know, increase of um, concentration for mergers can actually be a force to give monopsony power over workers. Of course, that extends to other forms of suppliers potentially as well. But that is something I think is a very hot topic. And, you know, I think I think the jury's out over whether that has increased a lot over time. But I think the general proposition that monopsony power is a really important factor in Western labor markets is, is, is now pretty established in labor economics. So, you know, most labor economists now would say that, you know, markets are not perfectly competitive. There is lots of imperfect frictions within markets, and that gives firms some degree of monopsony power to keep wages below the marginal profit of labor. And that's one of those areas where there is, unfortunately, a silos approach. So it's well established among labor economists. It's never been looked into by the competition law crowd. So apart from poaching, no poaching agreement, that's a very special thing. But monopsony or oligopsonistic type consideration, a merger, having this implication is something that competition authorities and competition economists never look into in practice. So in theory, but in practice, they don't. And uh, people like us are trying to say, let's start running cases, because that's the way you change policy by, by running cases. I want to take another question uh, from the audience, which I think uh, fits really well into the whole issue of mergers and takeovers, but uh, looking, taking a slightly different tack. Palami Bhattacharya has asked, how does a super soft firm acquiring a small firm, for example, Google acquired Waze, impact the product development and technology innovation to monopolize a particular market? So kind of going back from the monopsony side to the monopoly side in particular to the, the the rate of innovation let's say so um i would think that so this is one of the point which i think is very crucial to think about okay so innovation we all want it but sometimes we need to be specific about what innovation means to, i'm going to say first i want to answer the question and then i will so innovation we have to define a little bit what we mean by it because there is innovation which is great which creates value and that's something that as a society we like it and it's innovation that goes to consumers and to citizens there is also innovation that instead that reinforces a monopoly for instance, the, the first degree price discrimination, that's a rent extraction device. If you innovate to make the most perfect algorithm that can spot each one of us and keeps us uh, isolated from the rest of the universe, that's not good universe, not a good innovation for, 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 for consumers. And by the way, in policy, the standard concentrates on, on consumers, not on uh, total welfare for, and uh, for good reasons. And there's also innovation that destroys value. There's also innovation that destroys value, the type of, you know, the addiction example, which I told you, an innovation that engages you and you spend 20 hours a day in front of your screen, and that's not good innovation. So anyway, let's assume it's good innovation. But the important thing is the direction of innovation. So currently, we are in a system 
where the small startups that you mentioned are basically engaged in a very hyper-competitive beauty contest where they want to be seen by Google, me, 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 buy me, they just need to buy one. But this is type of innovation that these companies are often doing with the purpose of actually reinforcing the power of the, the Google, just to, to, to make a, 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 an, an example. So you innovate as a, a startup because you want to be bought by Google, you do something Think this is going to be helpful at the margin for Google, but this is something that is going to and, and entrench even further their own monopoly. Instead, this is a current discussion happening as we speak. We have a system with interconnection, interoperability. It's a different proposition if as a startup, you can grow. You don't need to be bought by, by Google. You can grow because you can stand on the shoulders of giants. So you can even be more, you can do a drastic innovation that now you wouldn't think about because it's too late to displace, uh, to, to displace uh, this uh, super incumbents, call it this way. So through a system of uh, well thought regulation, obviously they have to be well thought, we can also affect the direction of innovation. So. Again, strategy guys, I'm not a strategy person, but speak to the startups, speak to these guys and put them in alternative worlds. The current system where we are, no interconnection, no interoperability. The only way out is even either to become better than Google, good luck. And that's a proposition that very few people would think about or be bought by Google. So you are innovating to be in, the, in that ecosystem, as opposed to the system where we want to go, people like me want to go, with where you can survive, the famous Signal and, and Telegram, where you can still uh, um, com have a conversation with people on WhatsApp. But that gives a different incentive, I think, to the startup to innovate in a different uh, uh, direction. So that helps. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the problem is we agree too much. So. <laughs> but um, I mean, I, I, I mean, what I mean seems like you know, why, you know, why, why, Google Maps and Waze seem to be like you know that that's a merger to monopoly almost. It seems to me so. It, you know, I, I think there's a pretty good case for not not a lot, not not having allowed that. I guess yes, there's some advantages. Most of those advantages are you know getting all the access, the, the additional data that Google has. On, on us, but that seems again a bit of an unfair advantage that Google has. So the solution, as the master says, and this is a general thing, is somehow improving the access to the essential facility of data, which is the essential facility which gives many of these firms the, the monopoly power, is absolutely critical here. And that is, you know, that's easier said than done, of course, because one is, you know, who gets access and how, and that raises lots of issues of, you know, privacy and confidentiality and GDPR and everything else. But I think it is absolutely necessary unless, uh, because otherwise the, you know, the economies of scale with data and the economies of scope of using data across different parts of us that you know, we've been talking about is going to give the incumbent you know, such incredible advantages, it's going to be hard for other firms to effectively compete. So I do think this issue of how we really enable um, other agents to get under under, under a safe way access to, to data and to enable them to compete is uh, is is the kind of critical. Thing. I guess there's another strategy if we can't do that, and that's you know structural uh, structural breakup. But that's uh, you know that's a that's a that's a kind of quite a last that's a last ditch solution and is very difficult to do legally. But you know that's also on the table if we can't get decent access to data. I'm just keeping a little bit of an eye on the time and wanting to touch on, you know, just very briefly some of the current um, policies that, that have been uh, proposed in EU, in US, uh, elsewhere. Um, how, so, you, you know, you, you both have done a great job of highlighting a lot of the, the problems that we have um, and, and some of the, um, uh, the, the reasons why current regulations maybe are not, you know, up to snuff in terms of um, what we'd like to see. How optimistic are you that some of these new regulations that are being proposed will help to solve some of the problems that you both have highlighted? So we have a really a very intense fight at the moment because this legislation are not just being thought, they're being proposed and enacted. In Europe, we have something called the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, the DMU in the UK. There are uh, also uh, new laws in front of the EU Congress. So th this is all happening. And if you're interested, we can get details. But how optimistic we are. I think 
these are, first of all, regulations which are quite, it's about going to exempt regulation because exposed competition policy has failed. And these exempt regulations are similar. They will be enforced in different ways, but are similar in spirit. One is following the principle of contestability. So making, giving competition a chance, in a sense, through interconnection, data portability, et cetera. And the other notion is the notion of fairness, making sure precisely because some of these ecosystems are integrated, they cannot favor themselves. They cannot discriminate against the entrance, the self-preferencing type of thing. So these are principles which are happening. Um, I should mention also that China is a country which has acted uh, with uh, you know, the speed of light, they have already done it. They've already done a crackdown. They are already introducing. Have, so there is already interoperability for many. You know, Alibaba, Tencent, DD, and this kind of uh, equivalent of, the, of tech giants that they have in, in China. Maybe for different reasons. Obviously, one reason in China was that they understood that with economic power comes also political power. So it's not a coincidence that the crackdown uh, came along with a, a speech by Jack Ma that was not well received by the Communist Party. And so they wanted to limit the power of this entrepreneur, super rich, that was taking on the Communist Party. But similar to the EU, EU and the US, China also understood that, that, you know, innovation was not happening. The ecosystem of Chinese companies were not as good as it was 10 years ago because of monopolization. And they wanted to break up that mechanism. So that's... Uh, that's uh, uh, also happening there. Perhaps the difference that I see with China is that China has, um, you know, a set of officials or bureaucrats which are very well trained technically. So contrary to Europe and the US, they are really looking into the algorithm. They are concentrated on uh, on, on understanding and regulating the algorithms, the core of the of the platform. Plus, they also do some breakups. They've already said uh, they've already actually broken up. And so, so Alipay the lending has to be separate. So they they are they're already taken. But the spirit is fairly similar. How we will say how optimistic are we? I think uh, well, I'm an optimist by nature, otherwise I wouldn't be here. But the, 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 I would hope there are cultural changes. I don't want to sound too much you know, guru-like, but the, we need two cultural changes. One is a cultural change of regulators, which are currently are dominated by lawyers. We need lawyers, by economists. We need some economists, but we also need technologists. They don't have enough technologists. UK is actually at the forefront. I don't see the cultural change in the European Commission in Brussels, for instance. It's still run by the same people who failed on the antitrust. So sometimes you're left to wonder how did they fail on antitrust? How are they going to succeed on the exact regulation? So we need a cultural change there. But more importantly, we need a cultural change among the big tech. So the day we will see that the Google, the Facebook of this world, or the alphabet, the meta, as they call themselves now, are going to design products which are contestable by design, which are fair by design. So this is the, 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 the change in the design of the product. So, so we don't need to impose fines. So if the, the legislation, the, the legislative changes will be credible once we see product design of those companies changing, okay? And then at that stage, we will have a metric of a successful implementation, at least of the intentions of the law. So very quickly, we shouldn't underestimate the challenges. So one is the technological complexity, Two is the fact these are global companies and regulations local, not global. Three is the fact that there is huge lobbying efforts against this. Google's lobbying is greater than the total sum of all the trade union lobbying against Congress. Just one company is more than all of Labour. So we should not underestimate this. But I think I'm cautiously optimistic. Things are changing, as Tomas has said. Europe is kind of leading the way right on this. And there is a kind of political coalition. So you know, both left and right have an interest in this. It's not something which is something which is a left-wing issue or a right-wing issue. Competition is beneficial for all parts of, uh, of the political spectrum. And you know, there is a moment, I think, now when we might actually get some change, but I don't I think we should underestimate the challenges to affect that. All right. Um... John and Tomasa, I think this was uh, this was fantastic. Um, the only drawback or the only negative, I think, is that it was just an hour. <laughs> uh, this was this was really fascinating. Um, so thank you very much, um, Tomasa and John. Um, thank you everyone who joined for this program. Um, the next event on our speaker series is going to be on Thursday, October the sixth at twelve p.m. Eastern time or six p.m. six p.m. Central European time, when we're going to have three. 
other or three uh, three more uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Ronnie Chatterjee, Karen Mills, and Javier Miranda. And they're going to discuss kind of the other side of the economy. Namely, um, they're going to be looking at the role of business dynamism and entrepreneurship. So for now, thank you very much for tuning in and goodbye. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Thank you.